Hey everybody, welcome back to this series on preparing Curse of Strahd for Shadow Dark. Uh, in this video, I thought I would go through Bo Bone Grinder and Argon Volstolt and just talk about how I would change them. Because straight up, running them straight up, um, I think is going to cause trouble for your campaign. If you just take the creatures, take the things that are presented in each of those locations, and just transfer them over into Shadow Dark, um, like creature for creature, you're going to end up with some trouble. Um, that should be pretty obvious already, but it's it's sort of symptomatic of what you have to do to run the entirety of Curse of Strahd. You have to do this sort of thing everywhere you go. You can't just play it the same way that you would play Curse of Strahd. Okay, so uh, a perfect example of this is the Night Hag stat block. So in here's D&D Beyond. Um, this stuff is just all available on there. This is the Night Hag that you can see um, very clearly. She's got 112 hit points, 17 AC, so she's very hard. Uh, a challenge rating 5, 17 AC, they're going to hit her most of the time. You're looking at plus 5, plus 6 um, for your attack rolls. Probably plus 6 for challenge rating 5, but you're going to get a couple attacks. So Night Hag's not impossible to hit by any means. Magic Missile at will, Detect Magic at will. Plane Shift, Raven Feelment, and Sleep. The really only one there that matters is Plane Shift uh, because Raven Feeblement is not that strong and Sleep is just not going to do much to high-level characters, level 4, level 5 characters. So as written, this stat block isn't all that good. Magic Resistance is really strong. Uh, the Claws are good, doing 13 damage. Um, she's only getting one attack. And then she's got this change shape and this ethereal thing and this nightmare haunting, which is sort of a longer-term villainy thing. So really, as a stat block, night hags are not that bad. Now in 5e, old bone grinder is presented as sort of like an early place you can stumble into and get in over your head. And when you're level three, four, yeah, it's this is pretty deadly, especially if three of these night hags. Um, they're going to be doing a lot of damage. They're going to be hard to hit. Magic's not going to do much to them. And again, they're they're um, resistant to basically all of your regular weapons, and you're probably not going to have magic weapons or silvered weapons by the time you get to Bone Grinder. So, really, you're looking at 224 hit points, which is much harder. 224 hit points, obviously. You're looking at double the hit points. Um, and with magic resistance, that's just going to be really, really tough to fight. So, in 5e, you're, you're not going to die in a round by the time you run into them. You're going to be able to retreat. Right, that they're, they're not killing you in a round, but you're not killing them. And when there are three of them and they're not going down, and it's, you're going to get out of there. Then you've created kind of a longer term villain because now these things can haunt your nightmares, they can go ethereal, they can be all around. So I actually see in 5e why this creature and this encounter is the way it is. It's not instantly deadly, such that your players are just going to be wrecked when they run into it. Uh, it's given warning. You have the hag encounter back in Barovia. You have the raven on the fence warning people off from approaching Bone Grinder. So you have chances to get away from it. And then even when you've gotten into it, they're not going to outright attack you. They're going to try to, you know, get you to be involved in this creepiness. And so they're, they're, this is not instantly deadly. But even if it turns into violence, it's still not instantly deadly. The players have enough wherewithal to get away. And if the fight starts to go their way, for whatever reason, the hags can get away. They're, 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 um, they've got, you know, Again, plane shift and etherealness, and uh, they, they've got that ability to shift around. Uh, so, definitely a powerful um, creature, but by no means are we talking uh, just lethal. Now, can compare that, this stat block, compare that to the Night Hag from uh, um, Shadow Dark, which is what this is right here. Uh, so you've got AC 14, which is significantly higher relative to Shadow Dark than 17 AC is at level 5. Um, 37 hit points, which is significantly lower than 112, but again, relative to what Shadow Dark is doing, pretty high. Two attacks with plus 6, which means they're going to be hitting most people. Even people with full plate armor and shields have an AC of 18. And, and your players are not going to have full plate and shields when they encounter Bone Grinder. It's just not going to happen. So they're going to be hitting you most of the time. D10 damage plus blind, which is one target within near DC 15 charisma check or blinded for D4 days. I mean, if you're talking three of these night hags, every round being able to attack twice plus six D10 damage, which that on its own is going to kill most parties at level three or four, which is what they're going to be when they get here. But you add this blind ability... And that can happen every turn. They can attempt it over and over and over. Maybe you could house rule it, but if you don't house rule it, it's just as written. DC 15 charisma check or they're blinded for D4 days. 
uh, the, sorry, the players, if it goes wrong and they stumble into this and they start fighting, the players are just dead if you run three night hags, <laughs> right? So you can't do it. You can't just transfer it over. Okay, I'm gonna have three night hags and that's that. Now, maybe you have one night hag. Maybe you have one night hag. You notice that these hags are not immune or resistant to fire da or any kind of damage. They don't have any kind of special resistances. So if the players know it's coming, they can be much smarter about how to attack and they can get a round of surprise and then a round of attacks and maybe even kill this thing. But if this just is kind of like an even meeting, they stumble in, this thing knows they're coming and there's two more upstairs, then they're dead. So what I would do is to maintain the terror of this encounter, keep one night hack, really keep one night hack, but then substitute two other kinds of creatures. And you can use another stat block for this. I would say have her daughters, Bella and Ophalia, be, or whatever they are, sisters or brothers or daughters or whatever they are, have them be human NPCs, witches rather than hags, right? So they're like, what I, in my game, I'm calling hags daughters. Make them apprentices or um, make them cultists. Um, maybe make them priests and reflavor their spells. But make them something other than these really powerful night hags stat block. I would, I would recommend, personally, making them both cultists. Because they're fearless, you can reflavor their AC as some sort of protection. They've got 9 hit points, which is going to survive round 2. You could even buff that up if you want. Make them level 3 or 4 as opposed to level uh, 2. We'll give them 1 attack and give them maybe a plus 2 spell. And make it death touch. 2d4 damage to a creature within close so that they have that. Just use a cultist stat block and maybe buff it up very slightly. If you want. You can even leave it as it is. Because again, in, in Shadow Dark... Those combats can go real quick, especially if you have a hag, a night hag, that is blinding people. These cultists are going to be the least of their worries. So make the two hags there, give them maybe an extra spell, maybe give them magic missile, give them death touch, give them something from the witch spell list from Cursed Scroll Bolt 1. It's probably what I would do. So, as I said, today is going to be me actually practically doing it. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to take this cultist stat block and I'm going to go down and I'm going to go to Fiery Poltergeist, which is the last custom monster I made, and I'm going to do 80, oops, 83. We're going to do Hag's Daughter. And we're going to put this in. I'll come up with a description later. So we're going to do AC 14. I'm just going to say um, there's no reason for that particular AC 14. Uh, we're going to make them level three. Um, so what that means is that on average, that's another 5 hit points, that gives them 14 hit points. Attack 1, uh, we'll say, uh, you know, they're not going to be melee. That's what the other, that's the other thing is. Um, they're going to just do spell. One spell, and we're going to make it a plus 3. Um, they have death touch, which is a wisdom spell, and we'll give them, um, uh, let's see. Going to my document here, going all the way back out. We'll do uh, Shadow Dark. We're doing Curse Scroll 1. And we'll go down to uh, Spells. Uh, which Spells? And we'll do iBite. Perfect. So they have access to iBite, which is an instant near spell one creature. You target, takes d4 damage. Let's do this. So we're just gonna do, oops. I bite. Let's say wisdom spell. DC 12. And we're just gonna say, uh, one creature near takes d4 and can't see you, can't see Hag's daughter until the end of its next turn. That's it. Uh, oops. Okay. Um, 
Okay. So, uh, I'm gonna get rid of some of these things. Okay, so this is what I would replace. As I said, I would replace the two uh, Bella and Ophelia with these two stat blocks. Um, I'm going to do that in my game. But I, th I still think that Morgana can, Morgantha, sorry, can be a, uh, a night hag. I think that's fine. That works. Um, you just you need to be careful about it. Okay, uh, so that's that's the main change that I would make. Um, now in my game, I'm going to change a lot of stuff. It's not going to be this. Um, I'm not doing uh, dream pastries and like the kids and all that stuff. So I'm, I'm taking all that out. But um, I think this could still be an interesting place to have a hag and hag's daughters or, or witches essentially working with um, w working with her for her. Um, and, and to have it sort of, um, you know, I haven't yet figured out what I would use in the game. But I just, I hope that made sense, this this change from trying to run it as written in 5e2 to what we get. Okay, uh, so the other thing that I was thinking about was um, Argon Volstolt. Argon Volstolt, if you go to, um, let's see, I think I have a couple, uh, yeah. Um... Argon Volstolt is another example where, again, if you just run it straight up, it's going to kind of change the tone of what you're looking for. For example, let, let me find uh, uh, Q4. So Q4 is the, the spider's ballroom. Um, that's a good example of what I'm talking about here. These are the upper floors, obviously. Um, but, but Q4 down here on the map... Uh, I believe is is the room, um, is where you're dealing with, yeah, that's the room right down there, um, nine giant spiders. So if we look at giant spiders, um, the challenge rating one, and by the time you get to Argon Volstolt, you're going to be what level five, level six, uh, you know, again, pretty good, pretty good, uh, level five, maybe level six, um, that puts you well easily able to deal with nine of these things, right? Nine giant spiders. Okay, well, let's look at giant spiders in Shadow Dark. And I've just taken the stat block again straight out of the book and put it into here. And you can see it right here. So nine giant spiders puts you at around, what is that, 27 level, 27 levels worth of creatures. And, uh, you can divide that by the number of players, and that's kind of the average level of the party that they need to have. Something around there. That's one way of doing challenge rating sort of in in this. So giant spiders are level three creatures. So nine of them is 27. Well, that means you got to be roughly level seven or eight, right, uh, to deal with them effectively. Four level seven characters will be able to deal, on average, pretty, pretty effectively with nine giant spiders. And if you want to if you want to see why, just look at this stat block. Let's say you have um, four level say three characters. Four level four characters. Four level four characters against nine giant spiders in 5e is no problem. Yeah, they'll get wrapped up. Yeah, they'll take some damage, but they're going to be doing lots of attacks. Um, they, they're hard to hit. They're going to be hitting every time. It's just not going to be a problem. Right? It's not going to be a problem. Doing seven damage, you make a con save, you're going to take nine, maybe four damage. If you reduce your hit points, you're stabilized. So you don't even have to worry about death saves, really, because the spiders aren't going to kill you out. Right. They, they, they can't, really. <laughs> now, it's if the poison damage reduces the target to zero. So if the damage itself goes through, then they'll take that damage. So 5e means that you're, you're going to be restrained, you're going to be poisoned and unconscious, but you're going to be able to fight your way through it. Nine giant spiders is a bit of a challenge, but you know, a couple of big spells, burning hands... Um, and and you're, you're going to work your way through these spiders pretty quickly. Now contrast that with Shadow Dark. Shadow Dark, nine of these guys. Now, there's that's nine attacks at plus three, and it's a d4 plus poison, so it's not that much damage. You're not looking at a lot of output. So, so far, you could handle it. But that poison, DC 12 con or paralyzed for d4 hours. If a player fails this, he's out. Uh, out of the fight, at least. Right, that's really dangerous. Nine of these guys means if they win initiative, they could 
effectively wipe the party in one round. Right? Because the party could fail their con saves. So if they fail it, then the entire party's paralyzed and they're dead. Done. So you can't simply just run nine giant spiders. Right? Creatures like this, which can paralyze or take a creature out of the fight entirely, have to be used with caution in any game, but especially in Shadow Dark, because, uh, well, really in any game. And, and if you multiply them, then you're multiplying the chances that that creature will simply be gone, that, that, they're, 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 uh, that it will just be killed. Because, again, if you're paralyzed for D4 hours, even if you have, like, a cleric spell that can change it, which I don't know offhand of one, but there probably might be one, or you have antitoxin or antivenom or something, which, you know, you develop to kind of counter it, that assumes that there's somebody left to administer it. And there's no limit. Once you've failed this save, you might just go right back to being poisoned next round, because they bite you again next round. You have to make the save again. So even if you f succeed one round, you might fail the next. And in Shadow Dark, your hit, your your damage, unless you're you know doing a, a, a critical hit or a sneak attack, you're probably not going to do 13 damage in a swing, and you don't get multi attack. Now, if you have a, a, a wizard, he can cast something like Burning Hands, or he can cast something like, um, well, by level four, level five, you're not really looking at fireball. You know, if you have a fireball, okay, fine, maybe. But he could fail that save, or he could fail that spellcasting check. Then what do you do? So you have to be way more careful with the way that you use these creatures. So spiders is one example. So how would I change that room? Nine giant spiders. Well, I would probably put one giant spider and maybe uh, a bunch of regular spiders. Maybe a bunch of regular spiders. Now they're small, they're easy to hit. They're only getting plus one, and they're only doing one damage, but that poison is doing an additional d4. So maybe make it one giant spider, or two giant spiders, or maybe three giant spiders, and like six regular spiders. Right? Then you're doing a little bit of damage, you still get the sense of swarm, but you're no longer going to wipe the party if they all get unlucky. You want to try to avoid that. Especially in a game like Curse of Strahd, which is much more narrative-based. The idea that a random encounter with nine spiders, it's not really a random encounter, but it kind of is nine spiders and the party gets lucky three of them fail their cons if get unlucky three of them fail their con saves the last guy is by himself and he realizes he can't win this so he runs that's not exactly how you want the story to go um now we have another example revenants this is in q13 the chapel of mourning um q13 is just this big room here let's see if i can find it um q13 it's this room here, down here. So Q13 is um, three revenants, okay? So let's go down to the undead section and see what options we might have for something like that. All right, so we have ghasts, ghouls, uh, ghosts, mummies, skeletons, whites, wraiths, and zombies. Those are the, uh, the, the standard undead from the book. Well, Revenants, um, you don't have to use an undead for it. You could give an undead title. You might use a white, but that's pretty strong. But still, um, that would be doable. Three whites, they each 15 hit points, one attack. Uh, they get a sword attack and a life drain attack. It's D4 con. So it's a pretty good, it's pretty solid. Um, plus three to hit. So you're going to be hitting a good half of the time. This is a solid encounter. Three whites. And you could replace those revenants with whites, and I don't think it would be too bad, especially by the time you get there, going to be level four or five, maybe maybe you know level four, level five in Shadow Dark, that's doable. Three revenants is definitely doable. Okay, so that's another thing that you wouldn't have to change much. I would just use whites. Okay, now if we get to the upper floor, we get Phantom Warriors uh, and a Smoke Method. Smoke Method's a minor creature; uh, it's more for effect than anything else. But you could use a, uh, a smoke, uh, some sort of spirit or some sort of, you know, minor ghost. You wouldn't even have to make it a stat block, really. Um, but let's look at the spirit warriors. Now, the spirit warriors are in, um, I believe, they're phantom warriors. Here we go. They're in the book. So they're uh, 45 hit points, challenge rating 3, armor class 16. They're resistant to non-magical bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing. Um, they can see into the ethereal realm. They can move through other creatures and objects. Um, 
and their AC counts um, for its spectral armor and shield. I'm not sure exactly what that means. Oh, they just have a standard AC 16. AC 16. Doesn't change. Um, they're making two attacks, um, and they can enter the ethereal realm, and they're plus five to hit D3, D8 plus three. So they're pretty weak, honestly. These are pretty weak creatures, phantom warriors. And upstairs, you have a lot of them. You have a lot of phantom warriors, starting in uh, room 25, and then moving uh, room 20, yeah, room 25, and moving all the way up to upstairs. Uh, you're dealing with three or four at a time. Um, now, uh, you can run up if you, if you go through the trapped hallway in Q25, uh, then you can end up being attacked by seven at a time. That's quite a lot. But I think again, there you could use something like a white. That would be fairly easy to use. Um, you could just replace them and make them more ethereal. Um, so, so let's see. I was going to do some suggest. Well, I, I don't need to change any stat blocks there, but I'll, I'll add in a Phantom Warrior stat block. All right. So we've got number eighty-four. Is this eighty-four? Is the Phantom? Oops. Warrior. And, and I think I'm going to use the white stat block, but I will change a couple things. So we're going to go uh, copy. We're going to paste that there. And then, oops, we're going to trade out. Uh, so AC 14 sounds fine. And again, the same idea there. Heat these there. Um, I'm going to remove... Do ghosts have greater undead? Uh, yes, they do. Um, wraith. Greater undead incorporeal. I'm going to add incorporeal. So they can go incorporeal if they want. And that's all I'm going to do for these guys. So basically, it's just Phantom Warrior. They're, they're, they're exactly the same. Um, AC 14, hit points 15, attack 1. Uh, they get uh, this and a life drain. Do I want a life drain? No, they don't get a life drain. The Phantom Warriors don't drain your life. They're just ghosts. So we'll reduce that. So they're actually pretty simple. They're greater undead, but they're incorporeal. They get this attack with the incorporeal sword, and they... Hit you. Okay, so that's a Phantom Warrior. Pretty straightforward. Not anything too difficult. More Phantom Warriors, more Whites, or Revenants. Let's turn them into Whites. Um, I'm trying to look through the rest of this quickly to see if there's anything else that is particularly needs to be uh, statted out. No, I don't think so. Um, you could add a Spectral Longbow to this, the Phantom Warriors. Some of them have a bow. Um... Yeah, maybe I'll do that. Or spectral longbow. And that's gonna be plus. We'll make that uh, just plus one. And then we'll say it's a D one D eight. Four. Okay. Um, so. That's what we're looking at here. There we go. Okay, awesome. So this is all I would add in. Uh, you had the Hag's Daughter instead of the Sisters. You had the Phantom Warriors instead of the... Uh, we'll just use this stat block uh, in place of the Phantom Warriors from the book. Trade out most of the giant spiders with regular spiders and just kind of have a big swarm of gross spiders attacking. Um, now, this is all dependent upon your particular group, right? If you have, like, a party full of wizards and, and you know that they're all going to have fireball by the time they get there, then you're going to change things differently, right? But I'm talking about just adapting the book as written to something that's like this. You, you'd want to make these sorts of changes. Use whites instead of revenants, and they'll be pretty much good to go. And then use um, phantom warriors, uh, make... You know, to take the white stat block, remove uh, drain, and add in, in the incorporeal feature and give them the spectral longbow attack if they happen to have it. Not everyone does, but some of them do. And I think that's basically all you're going to need to do. All right, well, I hope this has been interesting. Basically, the idea here, obviously, is you just can't do it one-to-one, -one, and you have to be smart about this, this, this um, transition. It's not going to be the same in every case. Um, like, you know, is there a hard and fast rule for how to swap out monsters? No, you kind of just have to know what you're getting yourself into, and you have to kind of know what creatures can do. Like, the difference in spiders. The fact that the one spider's poison stabilizes you after death. The fact that this, uh, that uh, 
uh, Shadow Dark's spiders paralyze you. That's the difference you have to know. And so if you just start running it as written, it's not going to work. You have to make those adjustments. And then as a result of the adjusted creature stats, adjust the way that you're going to run them and adjust the numbers and things like that. So I hope this has been helpful. Hope it's been interesting. Um, yeah, and I will see you guys in another video.